Okay, guys, uh, today we're going to be talking about now about really how to endorse innovation to enable fintech. And we have the privilege today of having a dream team panel with some of my four guests today, where we're going to learn with, from them what has worked, but most importantly, what has not worked, which is most important from that perspective. We, get, we just got the formal uh, introduction, but I just want to give you something special about them. You know, uh, Massimo, who's on the, on, the, on the right side, one thing you probably don't know about him, a part of his job, he's also a big golfer and a big skier. I hear he's better uh, skier than a golfer, but again, if you want to talk about golfing with him with Massimo, he's there afterwards. Uh, Mariano as well, who you know from BNY Mellon. One thing about Mariano people don't know, he's actually originally from Spain. And when he's not doing banking, he loves to play the Spanish guitar and he composes Spanish music. So here we go. People thought bankers have no talent, but here we have that great example from that perspective. I'll move in as well from uh, Gorag on my left. Uh, Gorag, as you heard from his title at MasterCard, one thing about him that people don't know, Gorag, is a very active traveler. He's been now to over 60 different countries. So again, if you're on some travel advice, Gorag is the man. And Paul at the end, uh, one thing about Paul that people often don't know is before, before he went into consulting, he was a professional baseball player in the U.S. minor league system. You know, a great example how you move from being a professional baseball player to consultant. But hey, great to have you on board with us, uh, all of you today. So I think I'm going to start with you, Massimo, on the left, on the right side, and maybe to give everybody an, an idea of the panel today. You will be able to ask questions, as was mentioned. If you go in your conference app, there's a section called Live Comments and Questions, and then you write Conference Comments. And I'm going to get the questions here with me uh, on my app, and I'm going to be able to ask them. So you can ask these questions as we go along. Massimo, I'll start with you. We talked about right now a lot of stuff going on in innovation, and innovating in an organization is very, very difficult. From your perspective and what you have been doing at the, in, in this Sao Paulo, what has worked and what is the lesson learned you can share with the CEOs and the audience in the room? Yeah. Well, uh, it's something that you mentioned before, basically. It's probably more a learning path than, uh, than an error. We started off uh, setting up a, a, an innovation center, and basically the result is looking at the market, developing a POC, and then later passing to the next POC. I mean, uh, of course, this doesn't bring innovation uh, in the bank. Uh, you need to, to do something different. So we evaluate what to do to uh, take innovation at scale. And I would say that the lesson learned are a few, but are very important. First of all is bring innovation together with the business and uh, drive it as a business priority. Uh, this is a, a fundamental element. The second element is look at outside your, your own institution, bank, financial service, meaning um, you, sh you show before numbers are slightly different, but there are f uh, 40 to 50 billion investment in fintech. So it's like having an IT development that is just doing research on that. It's impossible not to believe that there is a good idea there that you can uh, copy or adopt. Uh, the other point was, uh, to try to import a fintech, you know, not invented here is an, an, an important part of the culture of each uh, bank. Then we retain, however, from the innovation center, the possibility to, let's say, look at venture capital, look at incubator, uh, research fintech and solution, because this is important and can trigger something in the business. I would say that another important thing that we did, for example, was to go outside in a more extensive way. We are, uh, as in Tesa San Paolo, here in Egypt, Alex Bank, uh, we, we are sponsoring uh, something that is called Be Heroes, meaning is a competition linked to a TV show where people tend to show their idea of entrepreneurship. The prize is above $1 million for the winner, not and bad. this is uh, important. I was very pleased to see here the vision that you have because uh, I think that uh, the ecosystem built around uh, the financial institution is fundamental. If you look at uh, the successful fintech place like UK, uh, like uh, I mean uh, Singapore and so California, all had uh, a government intervention that helped a lot uh, the, the, yep. the, the financial institution. If you take UK, they bring it. Uh, be, having a regulation that is very much pro-business, 
they funded the university, and then they tried, before Brexit, to be honest, to influence the European regulation. I mean, maybe the execution is not great now with Brexit, but the idea was great. It yeah, was, absolutely. you know, a consistent design. Well, I mean, you probably have to deal with Brexit as well, but that's, I mean, that's a whole different discussion. <laughs> and when you talk about your experience, at, obviously, uh, at, at, at the firm, you know, there's been a lot of, uh, you have the same challenges, actually, that Massimo has as well. What has worked and what has not worked as a lesson learned for the audience? Thank you, Henry. So, um, what is working very well for us uh, at BNY Mellon is um, precisely to have embedded the culture of innovation and transformation. Uh, I mean, if we think about our company, right, we, have, we are the oldest financial institution or oldest bank in, in America. We have been 234, 35 years young, right, and this, we are, we are still in the business, and we are in the business and we are growing because of our concept of innovation. We believe and truly believe that innovation is in our DNA, is in our blood to keep on growing and progressing and embedding new systems, new functionalities. And we truly believe that today we are living in a digital revolution in financial services, right? So uh, things that we are doing extraordinary that we didn't do in the past uh, because we are in a, a digital revolution. For example, we have, as of, as, of, as of last year, we have a chief digital officer reporting directly to the CEO of the company. Before, all the digital transformation and innovation was embedded into our technology function. Yeah. Today, we have a chief digital officer reporting to the CEO, and then we have the chief of technology reporting to the CEO as well. So that's reflection of the, of the, you know, the commitment on digital innovation and transformation. What do we think, you know, what can we do better, right, for the future? Uh, we think that you know, all the innovation we have, as Massimo was explaining, uh, you know, innovation hubs, innovation centers, that's all great and is necessary to do. But innovation it needs to be embedded in the whole organization. Yeah. And uh, innovation needs to deliver things. One of the things that you know, we have seen in the past is, yeah, we have great ideas, but there is little delivery, and delivery is absolutely critical. So that's... Uh, so that, that's problem. a culture of innovation, right? It comes back to that from that perspective. And, uh, and by the way, uh, we can ask questions to the panelists again with the app, so I'll take them in a couple of minutes. I just want to move it on quickly to you, Gorang, you know, because, you know, in my presentation, we were talking how a lot of organizations, they completely start from scratch because it's very difficult to put it in. You often talk about the need to move away from incremental innovation to exponential innovation. Can you share with the audience what I mean by that? Yeah, so when I think about innovation, in my view, the single biggest challenge that a large successful organizations have today is their own success. And that leads to unwillingness to disrupt themselves. Yeah. So more, of, more often than not, what I see, uh, these large organizations, they are focused on their internal data and they are focused on revenue optimization and business model optimization, which, which really is incremental if you really think about it. While in this rapidly changing environment, the need of the hour is really to re-evaluate your model on a regular basis and be willing to disrupt themselves rather than someone else coming in and disrupting you. Uh, and, and this is what I call as exponential innovation. So let me give you a couple of examples just to bring sure. these points to life. If you think about Kodak, and when Kodak was at its peak in, in its film business, they had the digital camera technology in their hand, but because they didn't want to risk the film business, they didn't really uh, bring it to the market. It's pretty closer. Uh, the other examples I'll bring in, when, when the Uber founders were trying to solve the problem of finding a cab on a, on a Christmas night, they didn't really look at trying to fund more taxis in, into the marketplace. They said, how can I make every single car owner a possible Uber driver. If I look at more closer in the payments industry, when we were hit badly with, with the car data breach challenges, yep. one way was to stop uh, sharing the car data, but that's, that's not possible. Hence, we looked at, one, making it difficult, but more importantly, how do we make sure that even if the car data is, is false in the hand of the wrong person, it's rendered useless through tokenization. 
So these are some of the examples where the business models were reevaluated to look at uh, solving the problem, and that's exponential innovation. Yeah, so not thinking big, actually thinking completely drastically and radically different. But Paul, I'll move it to you. Is that possible inside a bank? Frankly, can we have this whole transformation happen inside the bank or with the reporting lines, the constraint, or we have to completely go separately and actually go to manage this? So good question. I think what, what we see working with clients is two, there's two areas. Uh, one where they will take it outside the bank, so create a chief innovation officer, or as Mariano mentioned, a chief digital officer which is actually outside the bank or embedded within the bank and report directly to the, to the organisation. I think, so uh, one, not, one size doesn't fit all. I think one, one area that gets overlooked is the culture of the organisation, what should happen. So if you have an innovative culture, so I think innovation is, a, is, a, is an overused word, but I think if you have it outside your organisation, you, uh, you need to be fast, you need to make hard decisions, you need to be disciplined, and you need to have strong discipline. I think the perception of innovation is, you know, everyone sits around in, a, in bean bags and thinks up really cool things is, is, is actually relevant. However, you need to actually make sure that people coming up with ideas make very, very tough decisions very quickly on things that fail. So I think people here fail fast. So I think, but I, I think what we find within clients is actually the best organisations actually embed it in the organisation. But they also have to have a clear risk accountability and responsibility back to bank, the bank employees and bank shareholders and actually what they're trying to innovate. Because I think, I think most of you within your own organisations have we have people or innovative things that go on to create, you know, to, to, to drive things along. But the, the thing that we see the most is just that lack of discipline to say, I'm sorry, it's failed. We have to end this, move on. Yeah. It's a culture of accepting the yes. failure, right? Yep. And actually promoting that, the culture Correct. of failure. Correct, absolutely. Right? So actually, let, let's move a bit about that because this is an issue I think every CEO in the room will face, right? Actually, I'll move it to you, Gorang, from that perspective. It's when you look at... Um, Innovation, for a lot of organizations, it's a cost center. You know, it's actually the cost, innovation. How do we make sure we can move this from a cost center to revenue center, which as we all know, approvals go faster, it actually become a PL driver, and frankly, you become more relevant inside your organization. Yeah. See, when we, when we think about innovation and, and investment, and really look at it as a revenue driver rather than a cost, the first thing is, if it doesn't scale, it doesn't matter. That's if it the, doesn't scale, it does not matter. It doesn't matter. That's the most important thing if we think about innovation. Otherwise, it will just become a PR. Now, when I think about this, I look at three things, or I evaluate every innovation from, from three aspects. One, what is the size of the problem that you're solving? Remember, a scale that we're talking about. Uh, and it could be cost saving, it could be time saving, or it could be new revenue streams, uh, even disrupting your own uh, business model. So one is the size of the problem is important. The second, what is the value that you are creating uh, within that with your solution? And sometimes I look for partnering with like-minded uh, organizations and people to solve this problem together so that we create better value and we create it much faster. And once you solve a problem which is of large size and it has a value associated to it, don't worry, you will figure out a way to make, make revenue. Sometimes it's not clear on day one what your revenue line is, but as long as you're creating value, you will create revenue. And the third thing is, don't look at it as a short-term journey. Don't do it as what? As a short-term journey. Short-term journey, so look long-term. Look long-term. None of these business cases will look like three-year uh, break-evens. It yeah. may be longer cycle, but you need to have a con what we follow a concept of champion challenger uh, concept. Try to do a lot more things. Try to learn small, small learnings, and then keep implementing and keep moving forward so that you get to your right solution uh, quickly. So partnership and long-term, but frankly, that's not very easy. We have to be realistic, right? I mean, any long-term budget approval, we all know does not go very, very well, right? Because uh, you need the revenue. Let's move it to you guys, actually. And by the way, if you can ask the questions. Thank you, there's I know a couple questions coming in. I'm gonna look at them in a couple minutes uh, via the app. Um, I'll move it to you, Mariano. Harry, Harry yeah. can, I, can I add, before moving to, to the next question, right? So I think this question, that the previous question that my colleague was covering, is fundamental, right? So 
Um, I mean, considering a, a digital uh, innovation hub or a you know digital team as a cost center is plainly wrong, right? Yeah. So it's absolutely wrong. Um, the, in fact, digi all the digital innovation and transformation is has two main drivers in, in financial services. The first one is how can we be more efficient? How can we then reduce the cost of our operating model? And that on itself is adding great value to our institutions, yeah. right? So that's number one. But th then the, ne the second one is, you know, looking at the future as well as potential businesses opportunities, potential areas where we can grow and provide better client service, right? So I think hopefully no one in this, uh, in this room thinks that, uh, you know, the digital innovation or transformation is a, is a, is a, cost, uh, is a cost center on itself, right? So that's, that will be very wrong. Okay. And that's difficult to convince. I mean, you need to convince your management that it is a long-term investment, like Gorang was saying, that is worth ROI. But let's say you went over that, right? And people are convinced that it's an investment, it's not a cost center. How, you, how are, in your organization, right, your practical space, you're able to go over the regulatory concerns, the compliance issues, or even, frankly, a lot of people saying, ah, oh, we can't do this because of X, Y, Z. How did you go over these practical challenges? Yeah, thank you. So, I mean, th there are two observations here from my side. The first one is... Um, you know, what we did in our organization, we created a, what we call the Digital Council. And the Digital Council is not only technology people who they know about artificial intelligence and robotics and blockchain, etc. Our, uh, our Digital Council has representations, it's at the top of the house, and has representations from all the businesses, all the functions, and all the regions. So that means that we have, you know, all the different businesses that we have at PNY Mellon, but we have as well legal representing, yeah. we have risk, we have compliance, so we have people who are not digital experts, but they know the challenges that we are facing in the digital revolution, right? And these people are absolutely critical to make sure we are successful, right? So that's the first observation. The second thing is, um, you know, and, 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 and that's important for us as well, right? So, we cannot underestimate on this journey, we cannot underestimate the importance of working together with the industry and with the regulators. And the best way of overcoming the challenges that we have in regulation, the challenges on risks, is by working together. So I spend a lot of time in working with governments and working with industry associations who are, you know, the, at the end of the day, getting together and saying, okay, we want to move this forward. What do we need to do? How, what do we need to change in the regulatory framework to adapt or to embed the new, uh, the new functionality, right? So working together with industry associations, with regulators is absolutely, absolutely critical. No, it's actually a very good point you've made, raised regulators. I mean, we saw today in a presentation on the fintech strategy for Egypt, in many regards, many countries, like here, you know, regulators are very knowledgeable on fintech. And actually, that's, uh, they're open partners on that perspective, right? Which is a very good point. Uh, Massimo, from your perspective, I mean, these big issues, right? Is it a cost center or is it a, is it a revenue driver? But most importantly, how did we be able to get through the hurdles of compliance, risk, and so on and so forth? Well, uh, uh, the risks are, uh, are, uh, are very big, especially if you are a dominant institution. Your risk are, uh, uh, the major risk is your brand and your reputation. Just bring the of mic closer. Course, then you have, uh, let's say, GDPR risk, meaning data protection, you have fraud, you have compliance, and the fine associated to that can be very big. But on the other side, you want to go fast on innovation and not to, to go slow. Uh, going, uh, going back to what I said before, not invented here culture, what we did uh, is the following, basically. We created our own sandbox, not a regulatory sandbox by the government. We, of course, comply with all what is needed, but we try to integrate uh, at the minimum cost uh, uh, the fintechs uh, to experiment. For example, you say they don't have to comply with your architecture, compliance accept a different onboarding and uh, KYC, and so on before we were cutting in piece all the fintech and so making it impossible to bring them in. Now we accept as they are, we exploit the business with, uh, let's say, plafond, if it's credit, we limit the credit that you can grant through that uh, fintech and so on, and we create uh, this uh, environment where you are keen to exploit new opportunity. This is one story. Of course, 
if you move to other areas like uh, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, things are more challenging. And again, bringing the stuff at scale is the, uh, the complex part. Yep. Because depending on where you apply uh, artificial intelligence, that by the way, you need absolutely to give an instant response to, to the customer uh, in the digital environment, you need to know, for example, I mean, uh, what are the ethics behind it? Do you have, uh, I mean, discrimination factor that are in your intelligent factor? You, you teach, you know, you have this learning part, the machine learning, you teach the stuff. How you avoid that uh, the teacher uh, doesn't have bias on the, doesn't uh, not compromise the solution? Of course, these are not big issues if you are doing a POC, if you are addressing certain area like marketing, but as soon as you move to credit and so on, yeah. you, you, these are fundamental that you have to have in place, as well as the, uh, uh, the possibility to justify why you re uh, rejected credit or not. With artificial intelligence, if you go to a mathematician, he for sure can explain, but uh, you have to have a more comprehensible explanation. And though, so you have to work on that. So it's, uh, uh, you have to balance basically the risk with, uh, uh, with the speed at the end. Yeah, I mean, this ethics in the AI field is a, is a mind-blowing space that we'll have to deal with. Actually, a lot of venture capital companies now are putting ethics in their AI investments and code of conduct. Yeah, so. it, it, it's a fundamental step. It's not so difficult, but uh, you have to have uh, your organization that is conscious of this and takes the decision. Consequence yeah. management uh, that comes out of, of, uh, from that is, is and important. And that's one area we still need human beings to make these ethical macro-level decisions actually how these things are involved. Actually, maybe I'll bring it to you, Paul. I know EY, which you guys just released a, a document that comes and actually was titled, great document, a paper on the bank of the future and the workforce requirements on what are the type of bankers we need. I mean, in my presentation, I was mentioning how over the next couple of years, uh, we, one banking job out of three may disappear over the coming years, right? How are the, peop the bankers of the future, this audience, how would it look in 10 years in, in the world of banking? Right, so that's a, that's a really good question, actually. Um, so I think what, what we found, and actually I'll use um, my own organisation as an example, Ernst & Young. So I think it, traditionally in the past, you know, we would uh, we'd, we'd hire graduates in, they'd stay a couple of years, whether that's in tax, audit, consulting, and then they'd decide that they want to move on or they want to stay. I think, so us for, to attract the talent, for us to attract talent now, but also to uh, where we're losing talent traditionally past was in... Um, you know, they just go to another consulting firm. But we, we lose, uh, most of our people actually go to fintech companies because they're seen as an attractive place to, to, um, to, to do work. They find it uh, more empowering. So us as an employer have actually had to change the way we've actually engaged with our employees as well because we find that if we don't provide, you know, a, 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 a stimulating work environment, we don't understand their capabilities, we don't understand their future, um, that, that as an issue with us within turnover. Now, I also see that with my banking clients because, you know, banking is being, as you mentioned in your um, presentation, Henry, that, uh, you know, banking and financial services has been severely disrupt disrupted, whether that's AI automation. So I think probably most of you in the room are probably doing some kind of automation or RPA project um, and really, really think about kind of the automation of all of that. But what a lot of people don't think about is what is the human side of that? What do you do with all those people? You know, what, what, what do you do with all those skills? You know, is, is a key area, right? So I think kind of the banker of the future is, I wouldn't say is a, is a banker, it's a technologist, it's a, it's a communicator, it's a facilitator, it's um, an executor, right? Yep. So I think, the, and I think that's very, very key where in the past people in branches used to, take, used to come in and take orders, now they're actually expected to be solution orientated. So I think where we see with our clients, the bankers or banking staff now need to come solution architects or solution people to a problem. Yeah, it's interesting as well. We'll have some questions that we'll talk about it as well on the people element, right? On right. What's going to be the financial services staff mix yeah. in a couple of years, right? I mean, yeah. how is it different? Maybe I'll move it to you, Gorang. I want to come back to you actually, Paul, on where we're seeing innovation. Let's talk about, just to finish off, on the, more on the macro issues, right? Um, on your perspective, Gorong, when you see the payment space, and today obviously it's a big priority here in Egypt with a lot of initiatives, 
there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of friction in the system globally, right? What are you seeing the big disruptors? Do you think it will be the banks innovating? Like, what's who, who's going to disrupt Mastercard? It's going to be digital assets, large tech. Who are you who are you afraid about? I'm just afraid about one thing. About yeah. Which is our inability to move fast. Your inability to move fast, yeah. And and uh, ours as an industry as well. Because look where we are today. Even after 50 years, 60 years in, in, in this payments space, we are still at 85% cash in the world. Yep. Right? And that's, that's, a, that's a big path to, to cover as we look at our vision of a cashless society. And hence, I firmly believe in partnership because I see every single player who comes in uh, most of these disruptors that are coming in, they're really bringing some value onto the table, yep. right? And either in consumer experience, either in, um, in security solutions, either in, in some other uh, innovative solutions, and all that is doing, as long as it goes and tries to replace the cash and make it more seamless and drive financial inclusion in the market, I am a, am a big supporter of that, and I look at partnership is a model to go. That's what, that's what I believe. So you believe if you're not able to change fast enough, partnership is your approach? Partnership, see, no single player will be able to do it on their own. Hmm. People are living in, in some their own castle of the thing. Because I have a position of dominance, I can do it on their own. Yeah. What gives them is a responsibility that if you are in a position of dominance, you enable others and take them along and drive that change in the market that's really required. Yeah. And, th and that's what I believe. It's interesting about your cashless element. Now, actually, in certain parts of Asia, in China, for example, there's signs saying you are not allowed to refuse cash. Yeah. Just because everybody, everything, when I go, for example, to China, I'm actually often unbanked because I don't have a Chinese bank account and I cannot use uh, uh, WeChat Pay or Alipay, which is but, really remarkable how the shift happened quickly. But right? on that point, while you're saying you can't refuse cash, if most of the markets here in this region, there is nothing which says, hey, you cannot refuse a electronic means exactly. of acceptance. Like so, we saw so, today, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, before I move it back to you, Paul, I just want to ask you, Mariano, on your side, who are you afraid about? You know, what's keeping you up at night? The tech firms coming in, the Amazon, Tencent coming, your competitors next to you coming in, or you know, who, who are you afraid about? <laughs> we, are, we, we are not afraid of anything, right? Oh, of so, course you're not. Uh, <laughs> we, are not, we are not afraid, but we, 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 acknowledge, um, we acknowledge that we don't have any more one set of competitors, right? So the traditional competitors that we have had in the past, uh, they are still there. But we also acknowledge that there is non-traditional competitors in the market, and we just need to uh, understand what they do, understand the value that they are providing to the clients, and uh, understand how can we collaborate if there is a, an opportunity for collaboration, right? So um, I think probably if I, if I am afraid of something, or I, you know, I'm, I'm just uh, thinking, you know, what, what, is, what is the big threat for our organization, will be a traditional competitor who is spending a lot of energy and focus on a, an, 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 an partnership with, with fintech companies. That will be probably the biggest threat that we have, right? I mean, coming back to your, your, your picture of the you know, farmers with horses and then moving to tractors, we have been farming for many years, right? So <laughs> we know how, to do, uh, you know how to do financial services very well. I'm not afraid now of a fisherman coming to do farming, right? I'm afraid of another farmer who is, in, who is investing heavily in technology and is having the last super version of a Ferrari tractor, right? That's my concern, right? So, and this is what we are focusing on, right? So that's why I think in our organization, partnership is critical. And we think that the fintech companies are an opportunity for us to work together. And, and provide better value for our clients. We have more than 200 relationships with technology companies 
we have been acquiring fintech companies whenever it's appropriate. So that's why I think we need to we need to just make sure that we are maximizing the value from both sides of the world. But do you really think another bank, your traditional competitor, that are dressed like us, take like this, often there's a lot of people different banks, can build the, tra the Ferrari tractor? Yes. I mean, because what we've seen in other markets has been a complete outside player who's come in. Right? You can, you can. Uh, I acknowledge as well what you were explaining, the spaghetti, the spaghetti, spaghetti bolognese that we have, right? It's good so, Italian, you know. Yeah, spaghetti you bolognese. So, so it is true that, you know, the, our organizations or tra traditional banking sector, we have technology uh, functionalities and systems that are legacy technology systems. Some of them are, um, you know, are, are, have been running for many years. That's fine. That's fine. Let's maximize what we have, and let's maximize as well the use of new technologies to, to get the best of both worlds, right? So that's, that's our, and by the way, you, you know, when we were talking about, in your presentation, right, you were talking about, do we run a parallel bank, right? So you have a new digital bank, or what do you do, right? Our strategy, and you know, depending on the business model of each institution, right? But our strategy is to digitize the very bank, so we are digitized everything in our organization. It's not that we are having a parallel organization, we're just digitizing the whole lot, right? Wow. Yeah, different w story. What about you at the San Paolo Massimo? Are you guys taking the same approach? Well, uh, um, well, and also, let's... first, what are you afraid of? Are you afraid of another competitor, technology firm? What's, keep, what's afraid you from a competitor perspective? Uh, first of all, uh, I tend to agree with Mariano, but let me articulate uh, yeah. a little bit more. Here is because a Spanish, here is a Spanish and, a, a Spanish and Italian, Italian agree, So we right? cannot so, uh, uh, disagree <laughs> by definition, yeah. Uh, but uh, let me articulate more. It, it depends a little bit, uh, first of all, in uh, which market you are. If you take Europe, at the end, in Europe, uh, uh, we have a lot of uh, startup. 20% uh, of uh, the operator financial service in Europe are uh, new entrants, but uh, just 7%, uh, less than 7% of the revenue comes from this operator, okay? Yep. And uh, if you take out UK, it's uh, even much less. So that, uh, that is one element. Um, if you take China, as you saw with Alipay, it's completely different. So geography, uh, the government, the rule, the uh, banking, unbank and unbank situation is very different, so you would expect uh, Europe to be more conservative. Having said that, uh, we can say that we have big tech, fintech fin, and fintech tech. Fintech tech are just an opportunity that enable us uh, to change the operating model because we are their client. If we take fintech fin, meaning all the fintech that are creating this, the situation is what I said. So 6% of the revenue, uh, um, if you take Norway, I think it's uh, where is a cashless society, is yep. 2 3% of the revenue come from fintech. Although the risk is there because they are compromising our margin that are low and they are taking out the last mile. So what you said before, risk for the bank to become a commodity, very solid, very safe commodity, but unfortunately not profitable, yep. it's there, it's absolutely there. If you take the, uh, the big tech, and this maybe I slightly disagree with Mariano, because there is a part that they are taking. If you take uh, Amazon, 23% of the American has an Amazon card, Apple, 127 million on Apple Pay. On, on Apple Pay. Yep. So, uh, I mean, uh, the, the impact that they can have on certain segments is huge. My expectation is that they are focused on, uh, they see this as collateral business to ease their core business, that is e-commerce and so on. Easy checkout, uh, credit to go out and so on. But growing up, uh, building scale, they are a competitor. So, how do we respond? I think that uh, the role of innovation including fintech for a bank, is uh, enable the bank to change radically his service model and his operating model. We absolutely need to change drastically how we, uh, we do things. And of course, this should map, match sorry, the customer behavior. That yeah. is fundamental. We have to be slightly ahead of the customer behavior change in this, uh, in this transformation. So we can sleep at night in this case. Yeah, and that's, I mean, customer <laughs> behavior is, uh, you know, we always say that 70% uh, of millennials would rather go to the dentist than hear what their banks have to say, which is really incredible from that perspective, right? 
And also, like you talk about moving away from products, but moving from a service, right? Really delivering value to your customers the way they want it, right? It's, uh, I want to ask you here, often when I do my keynotes, I ask, you know, who enjoys your banking experience? And often, like you said, it's not where it could be. Paul, I'll move it to you. And, you know, from you in your job, obviously, you're covering a lot of markets. You're covering Africa, Asia, Middle East. You know, you're seeing a lot of what's happening. Where do you see the big threat to banks coming up and from innovation perspective? Should people look at Asia, Silicon Valley, uh, here, the Middle East? What do you think? Um, good question. I think, um, so I think... I think, yeah, your mic should be on, yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I think now it's on. No, no, press it again, yeah. Got me? Yeah, perfect. So I think, so it depends on the, on the business problem. So I think payments, and you've talked about it in this, in your presentation, payments definitely in China. Um, and China as well, yeah. Ch China is, uh, you know, I would say... You know, the, probably the most innovative um, country happening at the moment, particularly in financial services. And you know, if you know, if you look at just even our own organize, my own organisation, where in the past you know we would do study tours to Silicon Valley, or we'd probably go to London. I've got my colleagues coming to visit me, where I'd go and visit them. So they they want to come to our digital banking centre in Johannesburg. They want to come to our innovation hub in Dubai or our payment center in, in China. So I'll have my American US colleagues coming to visit me, but 10 years ago, we'd always have to go to them. So I think also, so Asia is definitely one area that, you know, I'd say China, Thailand, Indonesia. So for example, if you've been on holidays in Thailand and you want to buy street food, you want to buy some uh, fruit, and you go to the, the lady who's selling uh, cut up pineapple, she has a QR code on her cart. You yep. can pay for your uh, sliced fruit in Bangkok on a QR code, right? That, that is a huge, that a huge enabler for the economy. It's a huge enabler for SMEs, but it's also a huge, a huge enablement for female entrepreneurs, right? So there's a lot of things that are happening within Asia. I think also uh, um, in other parts of Africa, you know, um, M-Pesa was the, you know, the most famous payments provider out of Kenya. So, you know, Kenya is a, it was in, as a government, um, is actually really pushing the payments and innovation agenda within Africa. And then you've also got other parts of, of, of Latin America as well. So Mexico City, um, Sao Paulo in Brazil are, are, are probably other two big hubs, right? So uh, the key message that I tell my clients is innovation is not happening in Silicon Valley. It's actually happening outside in growth emerging markets. Absolutely. Yes, um, money is actually, the, the funding is coming out of Silicon Valley, but the ideas are actually coming out of your doorstep, right? So I think as bankers or you know, people in financial institutions, um, just need to look out the front door and you'll see that things are happening. You don't need to go to Mountain View and Silicon Valley to, to find things out. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would say conservatively, China is in B2C fintech two, three years ahead of the rest of the world, yeah, hands absolutely. down, which is very impressive, yeah. actually. Guys, we have a couple of minutes left. What I want to do right now is actually try to actually do something uh, unusual. I have my best friend, the bell, who's here with me. <laughs> uh, so I have questions for the, for the speakers. They don't know these questions in advance. I want one or two word answers. You know, so really quick, we're going to go one by one, and it'll be really quick answers, and hopefully and I have my bell each time as well to right. uh, launch it from that perspective. I'll start from you, Paul, and we'll move on to here. First question to you. Um, your 18-year-old nephew comes today and asks you what course he has to take at university. One course you tell your nephew that he has to take at university. What course is it? Uh, Alexa. And what, sorry? Alexa. Alexa. <laughs> How to use Alexa. Gorang, what's the one course you recommend a young student to take right now? Nanotech. Nanotechnology. Why nanotech? The world is going nanotech. Yeah, here you go. On your side, Mariano, what you, what's the one course you recommend your 18-year-old nephew in university to take? Ethics. Ethics. Yeah. There we go. The big AI questions coming up. Massimo. Ethics. Again. Ethics as well. There you go, man. Who would have thought philosophy uh, is making a comeback uh, from that perspective? Second question. I'm going to start for you, Massimo. Tomorrow morning, you have the chance to launch a fintech startup. You have the choice of the following co-founders. Which one you take? Mark Zuckerberg, Jack Ma, Elon Musk, or anyone else? Who will you choose? Jack Ma. Why is that? Why Jack Ma? Jack Ma, I like him. I like uh, how he approach the business, how he create uh, something from uh, scratch. Excellent, and, uh, excellent. Mariano? 
Well, I would choose I would choose Alexander Hamilton, which is our founder of BMW Mellon, who was a great visionary, right? So <laughs> great uh, promoting the company there. Here you go, If you want startup, who do you choose as a co-founder? I'll go with Jack Ma. Jack Ma as well. Yep. Any reason? Same reason. Oh. Uh, Jeff Bezos. Uh, Bezos. Amazon. Yep, Bezos. Yep, absolutely. Am Amazon. Exactly. Clear. Yeah, incredible he's done. Yes. I'm going to start a question from your side as well now, Paul. It's an interesting one for you. Your nephew, again, he asks you a lot of questions. Your he nephew. asks a lot of questions. He yeah. tells you that he has a couple of job offers. One job is with a large bank. One job is with a startup. One is at a big four consulting firm. And one is at a governmental regulator. What job do you recommend he takes? I've just had this question with my daughter, 21 year, 21 year old, uh, about three weeks ago. So I told her to go to a fintech. Fintech startup? Yep, absolutely. Really? Why is that? Why, um, it's just m more exciting, uh, fits her personality, and I think there's a, it's, a, it's a better future. So, yes. Awesome. Goran, one I'm, job offer. Which one do you recommend? I would go for the large corporation, uh, primarily really? because I said, if it doesn't scale, it doesn't matter. And in large corporation, you have the opportunity yeah, to do that. Good. Learning how to scale. Good, good point. On your side, I will, I, will also, I will also choose a large bank with an executive support to transform and digitize the company. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> we got to tell him which bank that is so he can go join that one. I'm sure it's uh, BNY Mellon. Massimo, which job you offer your recommend well, takes? I, I've been just hired by Intesa to do that, so digital transformation. So uh, it's my choice by definition. Join the bank. <laughs> okay, I'll start from you, Massimo, on this side. Tomorrow I give you a million dollars. And I, tell, and I t ask, tell you, you can start a fintech startup in the vertical of your choice, in the industry of your choice. Which industry you launch, which vertical you launch your fintech startup? And I give you a million dollars. I would say AI on the regulation. AI regulation, REC yeah. basically. REC tech. I will, also, I will also go with REC tech. I really? think there are great opportunities there. REC tech, yeah, REC -tech. Yeah. it's uh, very hot. Uh, lawyers are back in action yeah. today. Like what will you launch? One, I give you a million dollars and then you can launch a fintech startup in the vertical of your choice. What you pick? SME lending. SME, SME lending. lending, yeah, absolutely. Also Paul? Uh, I would pick agriculture and I would pick uh, SME lending as well in agriculture. Yeah, good point. That's a very, very interesting point. Paul, this one, two questions left. What is keeping you up at night? What are you paranoid about when it comes to the future of finance? Um, the unknown, what we don't know is what we don't know. Yeah, the unknowns, unknowns. Yeah. Good point, Greg. What is keeping you up at night what, on the future of finance? Are we moving fast enough as an industry? Yeah. As an industry, huh? Yeah. No. Are we catching up? Yeah. I'm going to add two things. One, th one thing is regulation to make sure that there is a level playing field across the traditional and non traditional competitors. Yeah. So everyone is regulated in the same way. And the second thing is data to make sure that we have mm. a very good, clean data to do all the things that we want to do. Yeah, data like big problem with banks. Massimo, what, uh, what would it be yours? Um, I stay on three things. First uh, is uh, data, clean data. Yeah. Uh, second point is change of culture. Yeah. And third point uh, is a service level because uh, yeah. you have to be always on when you deal with the digital customer. Absolutely. Last question, I'm going to start from you, Massimo. To end the panel, if you were not doing your current job, what would you be doing? Um, hiking in the mountains. Hiking in the mountains, here we go. <laughs> Playing my Spanish guitar in the Pyrenees. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear you play that Spanish guitar. Go wrong, if you're not doing your current job at MasterCard, what would you be doing? Travel agency and exploring the world. Travel agency, here we go, exploring the world, love it. And Paul, to finish off our panel on FinTech adoption, if you're not doing your current job, what will you be doing? I would be a professional surfer. Professional surfer, here yes. we go, here we go. <laughs> I told you consultants and bankers are more fun people think. Guys, thank you very much. A big hand at Paul's for our panel. I let our MC back on the stage. Thank you very much. Excellent.